Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Guillermo Rodriguez. I'm the head of variance and data here at the Center for Homelessness Impact. I'm really thrilled to be joining you today uh, on behalf of our CEO, Dr. Alicia Dr. Teixeira, who had uh, an emergency and was unable to join us uh, this day. I just really wanted to welcome you and thank the team at the Camp of Collaboration for this invitation um, to discuss the theme of this session, which is how can we really start using evidence and gap maps to commission homelessness research. So the team at Camel Collaboration asks us to share some of our experiences of working with them on their first evidence and gap maps on homelessness. So for the next hour or so, you will be hearing from my colleague, Nick Bartholdi from the center, who will be telling us a bit more about the experiences of using the AGMs in our work. And from Sabina Singh from the Camel Collaboration, who will be telling us a bit more about the development of these tools. The evidence and gap maps are really important because they bring together all of the evidence on homelessness interventions from around the world to start highlighting where the evidence does exist and where there are relevant gaps that we need to start plugging and start to fill as we continue to commission new pieces of research. So this is really important because it helps us to target research investments in a way that is a lot faster and much more strategic and as a consequence with potential better impacts down the road. The Center for Homelessness Impact was created in 2018 with a mission to accelerate progress towards ending homelessness through the better use of evidence and data. So of course, the evidence and gap maps and the other resources that we have created over the years are the foundation to help us achieve that mission. We really work hard to enable people working in homelessness to achieve breakthrough results, to ultimately create the society where homelessness is prevented whenever possible, and when that is not possible, then it's rare, it's brief, and it's a non-recurring experience. We st started that journey a few years uh, back, and at that point, there was no reliable evidence, no reliable tools to help us identify what we know and what we don't know yet. Evidence, as you know, was scattered all over the place in different databases, in different journals, in different way websites, and in a substantial amount of great literature. But there was no really simple way for decision makers to get a quick overview of where that existing evidence base was. And that was a crucial barrier to help us use evidence to improve outcomes. So to address this challenge, we decided to join forces with the Camel Collaboration and create the first evidence and gap maps in homelessness, which we have continued to use to try to identify what works and then commission the research in ways that are more effective and also less costly from a commissioning perspective. So this is really a good reason to be here and hopefully this will be a really informative one hour. So welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Nick Ratholi, who is uh, an evidence implementation specialist here at the center. Nick, over to you. Great. Thank you, Guillermo, for that introduction. And um, thank you to everyone for making the time today to hear the story about how the Center for Homelessness Impact um, uses robust research to inform policy and practice in homelessness. And today we'll be focusing on the role of the evidence and gap maps um, that I've played in the Center um, that we initially created in 2017 and have been updating on an annual basis. Now, these maps collate all global research that explores what works to tackle homelessness and how to best implement those interventions. So in terms of the um, objectives of this session today, get a you just go to the next slide, please. Um, so we'll first be talking through why we ended up building the evidence and gap maps for homelessness. Um, then moving on to what the maps taught us about the evidence base. In the following section, we'll be covering how we've used the maps to contribute to that evidence base. And finally, and very briefly, talking about how we've used what we've learned um, from the findings within the research base to influence evidence-based policy and practice. So we know that homelessness devastates lives and that it's systemic, stubborn, and it's cyclical. And there are a few examples of um, the huge challenges people experiencing homelessness face. So, for example, people are 17 times more likely to have been victims of domestic violence and 10 times more likely to die than those of um, people of similar age in the general population. 
And we broadly understand the root causes of homelessness and what problems need to be solved. So we know that homelessness is primarily a poverty issue that's exacerbated by a lack of affordable housing, high rents, cuts to benefits, and a lack of access to um, the right services at the right time. So we understand the causes of homelessness, but what we don't have is enough of the right types of evidence to understand what works to effectively tackle the problem. And we know in social policy over the last 40 or 50 years, there's been a lot of progress in figuring out what works by building in more robust research methods um, of research. But in homelessness, we're still lacking in that area. In other areas such as criminal justice and education, they're more informed about what works, but there's still a lot to be done in homelessness to get to that point. Additionally, over the last 50 years, we've made a lot of additional resources available to the homeless sector, but we still see increases in the numbers of people experiencing homelessness. And the sector is still under-resourced, but we can do a lot more with what we have. So we need to shift the culture in the sector to question the status quo and create a learning culture of experimentation to make sure we do the most um, with the resources that we have available. So our approach works across three key elements. So the first element is to build a reliable evidence base so we know what the effective and cost-effective interventions are. Secondly, we need to put that evidence in the hands of those that can make the most of the evidence. So that generally means working with local and national government and other practitioners to do more with what we have. Finally, we need to promote a learning culture where people are more open to trying new things and experimenting. And evidence and gap maps are the foundation for building and understanding that evidence base, which then allows us to achieve that second and third goal of implementing and embedding evidence-based policy and practice. So then that first step in building a reliable evidence base was understanding what evidence currently exists. And at the center, we focus specifically on interventions that aim to improve outcomes for people experiencing homelessness. This means that the evidence that's included in the maps includes only research which evaluates those interventions. There are broadly two types of evaluation that we can distinguish at this point. So first are those evaluations that aim to quantify the impact of an intervention on outcomes. These quantitative evaluations measure the effectiveness of programs and services on people's lives. So for example, they might measure the impact of an employment program on someone's housing, employment, and mental health outcomes. We therefore group those evaluations in what we call our effectiveness map. And I'll go into a bit more detail on what that looks like in a second. The second type of evaluation aims to understand why interventions work well or not. They take into account the experiences of stakeholders, including the people receiving the service, the people delivering the service and policymakers. They also look into contextual factors that influence why something might be working well or not. Now, these studies provide an understanding of how and under what conditions we can implement a service and give it the best possible chance to work well. We group these evaluations in the second map and what we call our implementation map. And at a high level, these maps can tell us which types of interventions have been researched often and which haven't. And this indicates, as the name suggests, um, where the evidence is and where the gaps are. But we actually view both maps as a matrix because each has more information than just that, displaying what each piece of research can tell us. So we'll look first at the effectiveness map. And we can see that we have different types of interventions in the rows of the matrix and different types of outcomes in the columns. Now, this is because the types of complex interventions that are used to improve the lives of people experiencing homelessness can impact people's lives in many different ways. So some might improve people's well-being, their contact with the criminal justice system, their employment or their health outcomes. And researchers are often limited on the number of outcomes they can measure. 
for kind of theoretical, practical, or cost-related reasons. And this means that the frequency with which some interventions are measured against certain outcomes will vary. So taking an example, we'll look at a program um, which works with people leaving prison, right? So the impact of those interventions is typically measured through reoffending rates because we're primarily looking at people leaving prison. So the primary outcome that people are generally interested in is reoffending. The issue here is that almost no studies evaluating interventions for people leaving prison report impact on, for example, housing stability. And this really limits what we know about the effects of an intervention and shows a clear gap in the research beyond just looking at which interventions are researched more and less frequently. Um, and just briefly, kind of the sizes of the circles that you can see here indicate the number of studies um, and the colors indicate both the types of research that's being produced as well as the quality of that research. So looking then at the implementation map, which contains that qualitative research, we're not looking at um, measuring the impact of interventions. What most, most of this research focuses on is what facilitates good program implementation and what hinders good implementation. Therefore, rather than the columns displaying which outcomes research measures impact against, they display the different issues that impact implementation. So taking again the example of programs designed for people leaving prison, researchers will often note access to non-housing related support. So that's things like um, medical care, substance use or mental health services as a barrier to successful implementation. So for example, people aren't receiving um, the right types of mental health support that can often really hinder successful implementation when trying to get people um, out of prison into housing and to improve outcomes generally. Um, on the other hand, much less is said in that research about the impact of kind of buy-in from recipients when people are leaving prison. Now, that could be really critical, but we know a lot less about that because it's just reported on less frequently, again, indicating a gap in the knowledge base. Um, in this map, the colors indicate whether issues are reported as either barriers or facilitators to program implementation. Now, there's a lot that we've learned from these maps, and I don't have time to cover everything, but um, I'll cover some, what, some of the really high level stuff that we found that's really critical here. So one of the main findings from the map is that the vast majority of the evidence base comes from North America. And this is particularly true with effectiveness research. A staggering 89% of quantitative evaluations within homelessness are from North America. And we've run into issues here when trying to translate um, the findings from some of the research that is influenced contextually by mainly social policy issues within the US that don't translate as cleanly to the UK. So a lot of the times we really want to see more research being done within this context so we can have a definitive answer to how well things work in this different context. Whereas there's still some things that we can translate across. We really want to see more, um, more quantitative evaluations in the UK. Um, but we do see a far stronger tradition of qualitative research here. So um, the UK accounts for 28% of studies in the implementation map, which is far higher than the proportion that we see in the effectiveness map. And it's clear from the chart on the following slide um, that we know far more about some interventions than we do about others. So we know a lot about um, interventions to do with health and social care, um, services and outreach, and different accommodation-based interventions. So these are overrepresented compared to other intervention types. However, we know close to nothing about finance, communication, legislation, and employment interventions. So this really shows us where there's a wealth of knowledge to learn from and where we know very little. Um, promisingly, the numbers of studies for both effectiveness and implement implementation studies are increasing rapidly each year. You can see um, on this slide and the following slide, which shows effectiveness and implementation studies published over time, that both are increasing really rapidly, especially in the past four years. So we've seen around 50% of effectiveness studies and about 60% of implementation studies were published after 2014. So we really hope to see that trend continue um, of increasing numbers of studies published in this space. 
Okay, so we've now established what the maps are and examples of the types of information we can learn about the state of the evidence base. But how can we use the maps both to enhance the evidence base and also to influence policy and practice? So we can use the maps for research purposes primarily in two ways. So firstly, um, by identifying where there's a lot of evidence, so evidence is plentiful in these areas, we can decide to commission systematic reviews of the literature. This allows us to aggregate research findings, both quantitative and qualitative, to understand what the evidence base is collectively telling us. Um, and to date, we published a systematic review on accommodation-based interventions, and three other systematic reviews um, are currently underway and reviews of both case management interventions and of substance use interventions um, will be published this autumn by CHI. Secondly, we can use the maps to identify the gaps in our knowledge. And once we understand where the gaps lie, we can commission trials, um, which will provide us with answers we didn't previously have about what works to tackle homelessness. For example, we identified that there was very little evidence of what works in terms of cash provision, employment, and prevention. And we consequently either commission our own trials or work with other centers where, um, and government bodies working in similar spaces to run, these, um, to run these trials in those areas. And we really focus on interventions that are both understudied and highly promising based on literature in other areas outside of homelessness. Um, and you can find out more about um, our research via the project pages on our website, which I can post in the chat um, after the session. So these reviews and trials provide the information needed to create better and more evidence-based policy and practice. But having the information means nothing without putting it in the hands of policymakers and practitioners who can use that evidence to create real change. I won't dive into this too much as this could be an entirely separate discussion, but I'll just briefly discuss the ways in which we make that evidence accessible. Um, so through our website, there are two main ways that we do this. One method is through our online intervention tool. Um, now this tool displays information for 20 of the most commonly um, implemented interventions in homelessness, and it details um, what the intervention is, uh, what its purpose is, what both the quantitative and qualitative evidence suggests, um, and includes which outcomes it impacts either positively or negatively, um, and how to implement those interventions well. Um, we've also published concise, what we call evidence notes. Um, these notes describe what the evidence suggests regarding different areas of policy, um, last year, we published an eight-part series describing the effectiveness of interventions for areas such as kind of substance use, prevention, and employment. And a key difference here compared to the intervention tool um, is that it allows users to view a range of interventions within a category of interest rather than through um, an individual intervention. So it's a bit broader. Um, the access point is different. Um, okay. So we've laid out why the maps were created, what they can tell us, and how we're using them to expand the evidence base and to inform policy and practice. There may yet be new uses for the maps um, that we haven't yet encountered, and we encourage anyone who's interested to engage with the maps and use them in either the ways that we presented or in any other way that would be beneficial. Um, thank you for listening, and I will now pass on, I believe, to Sabina. Thank you for that, Nick. Sabina, over to you now. Thank you, Nick, for the wonderful presentation, and thank you, Guillermo, for this opportunity. Sorry for the pitch. I think the screen is visible now, right? 
Yep, I'd say. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, uh, as Nick has already set the context for this presentation, like uh, there are two kinds of maps we have uh, for homelessness, basically for addressing issues of uh, if effectiveness of interventions or implementation issues of interventions for people experiencing or likely to experience homelessness. Uh, I'm Sabina Singh and I'm Director of Research at Campbell South Asia. Uh, so first of all, uh, we would just talk about, uh, I'll give a brief introduction, though Nick has already done that, but this, uh, this presentation will mostly be on lines of the process and some of the overview of findings. And as Nick has already told, told you about some of the outputs that reviews and toolkit, and I will be briefly touching upon all these things. Uh, so first, uh, this app was commissioned to us by the Center for Homelessness Impact United Kingdom, and we had two separate maps for effectiveness and implementation. And this has been a longer association, like we are already in the fifth edition of the map. Like these maps can be annually updated or can be updated at any other frequency desired by the commissioner of the map. So we have uh, completed four updates of the effectiveness map and three updates of the implementation map. We are currently working on the fifth edition of the effectiveness map and various people have contributed uh, during these, uh, I mean, of course, over the five years, different people have joined these projects. For example, Howard White, Ashri Kassan, Ashwini Bama and Pusha Bama were there in the initial first two updates of the map, or rather three updates of the map. I took uh, forward from the fourth update and the third update or fourth update of the implement effectiveness map and the third update of the implementation map. In uh, addition to me, Shweta, Oliver Bolling, Ranjana Rao, John Ayers, they've joined and the current update is being taken up by Shalu Jain. So we've uh, used various uh, innovative methods during uh, the update of these maps. For example, we took help of the Cochrane crowd for screening a title and abstract during the fourth update of the effectiveness and third update of the implementation map. And Anna Noel Store was the person responsible there. And of course, many volunteers across the globe, they helped us screening the title and abstracts. We had a particular process for that, like people had to undergo uh, a certain kind of training through a module and only then they could access the exercise. I will just talk about briefly about this process in the upcoming slides. So the software that we use uh, uh, at Campbell mostly for our most uh, evidence products, be it evidence gap maps or systematic reviews is API Reviewer. And we have used API Reviewer 4 and uh, uh, even the web version, the beta version of this uh, software. And we use API Mapper for generating the map. If, even, I mean, of course, during the uh, process, we of course use Mandalay or Zotero as citation softwares and some Sometimes we even use Google spreadsheets or Microsoft Excel spreadsheets. So this is just a brief, uh, uh, sorry, this is just a snapshot of this map. So this effectiveness map. So this says, as Nick has already shown you, so these bubbles actually represent the, uh, the magnitude or the volume of the evidence in a particular area. And the color could be coded as per your choice. For example, you can either uh, use these colors to differentiate various study designs or you can even uh, use these to uh, show the confidence in the findings of these studies. So here we have used these studies, uh, colors to show the confidence in findings of these studies. So what were the PCOs for this map? As uh, Nicole just already told that this map is actually meant for people who are actually homeless or they might be likely to experience homelessness. So the eligible subgroup, as he was mentioning during his presentation, could be prisoners, could be people sleeping rough, could be people who might be uh, uh, getting, uh, might be having mental health problems or people with alcohol or drug related issues uh, and certain people with disabilities. Uh, so basically we are covering the population is people who are already homeless or the ones who might be at the risk of being homelessness, homeless again. So the interventions for this uh, particular, uh, uh, evidence and gap map or any intervention that are aimed at preventing or supporting measures to prevent homelessness among any of the population or subgroups of population. For uh, mostly the effectiveness studies, we had a comparison group. So they could be people who are either receiving uh, uh, no intervention at all, or they could be receiving different dosage or duration of intervention. Uh, and they act as a control or comparison group as the case may be. And then there were various outcomes related to healthcare, crime and justice outcomes, housing stability outcomes, health-related outcomes, 
mental health, employment, income outcomes, uh, and even for, uh, public attitudes and participation, such as fundraising, engagement, all those things. And the settings uh, which one should note that this map is confined to high income countries only. So that is that were the peoples for this map. And uh, as uh, was mentioned before as well, that we have two different maps. So we had different frameworks for these maps. As in, uh, if you see along uh, this evidence in gap map, for example, here. So uh, along the rows, you would see generally the intervention categories. And the upper uh, column, I mean, the rows, uh, uh, rather, so they would either have intervention, uh, sorry, outcome categories, or they would have barriers of facilitators. So this is an, a snapshot of the effectiveness map. So we do have outcome categories. And in a implementation map, you would have uh, the barriers of facilitators in this particular area of the map. Uh, so uh, as regards the possible, as with several other evidence and gap maps, so uh, I was not actually part of uh, these discussions when this uh, association or this collaboration started with the CHI, but I'm pretty sure there would have been uh, extensive rounds of discussion, and that is how they arrived at such exhaustive list of intervention categories. So these are the, uh, on the left-hand side here, you see the various intervention categories, and here are the various subcategories. So similarly for the outcome categories and subcategories, so these are given uh, uh, in this slide. So uh, in, as I said earlier, intervention and outcome are basically used for the effectiveness maps and the intervention and barriers and facilities are used for the uh, implementation issues map. So here uh, you can see that uh, there are different kinds of factors, which could be contextual factors, policymaker or funder related factors, staff or caseworker factors, or recipients of program related factors. And as uh, people who are familiar with the implementation uh, field, they might be knowing that the same factor can also act as a barrier or facilitator under the same context or maybe under different contexts as well. So these were basically uh, the barriers and facilitators classification, and these are the sub classifications. So these are not actually, I mean, I've tried, because of the space constraints, I've some very used the short forms or uh, consolidated the categories. But if you're interested in looking the detailed categories, you can actually refer to the reports of these maps that are there on the CHI website. Uh, so now I'll move on to the innovations and methods that were followed during various updates of this map. So uh, I'm going to touch upon three uh, different kinds of uh, methods of uh, uh, sort of innovations that were used during various editions of this map. So one of these is machine learning search, which was done along with the database searches. Then uh, during the fourth update of the map, uh, the CHI they came up with uh, this suggestion that we might have some intervention specific search terms, which might get us more studies that we were probably missing. So they gave us some synonyms of the intervention uh, subcategories and they were quite helpful in locating the gray literature around this area. And uh, even uh, during the fourth update itself, we also underwent, uh, we took help from the Cochrane Crowd for title and abstract stream. So I'll be briefly touching upon uh, what were the kinds of, you know, basically the process part of it, like how we did this. So if uh, someone's familiar with the API Reviewer, they do have a machine learning feature in this uh, API Reviewer, which was earlier Microsoft, uh, uh, called Microsoft Academic, and now it is called OpenLX. So, uh, but one thing that one should know is that to run a machine learning search, you should first have some number of studies or some set of studies that are actually screened or classified uh, as eligible. And machine takes that as a, kind of uh, set and kind of matches that set of studies with other uh, potentially eligible studies. And then you have to actually tally those records or classi the classification is done already, then you have to uh, screen those studies. Uh, so basically it helps you uh, get some more studies that might not have been got uh, through other uh, sort of, you know, uh, processes like database searches or, uh, and in addition to that, of course, to real, real literature search and as we call the systematic search of real literature. So the search which is carried out very systematically. Uh, so within that, uh, I mean, we uh, did follow the, uh, the conventional practice of the systematic search of gray literature, whereby we did search uh, uh, Boolean operators uh, in, in search engines like Google and Google Scholar. Then we 
used very, uh, the same keywords to uh, search various websites of various countries, the official websites or the NGOs or the charitable organizations that might be working in the field of homelessness. We did hand search for some of the journals and we also tracked the citations, like basically we did the backward citation tracking, whereby the references cited at the end of, each, uh, of the included papers were uh, sort of, you know, uh, classified or were uh, imported in the API review for, for eligibility for screening. So as I mentioned, uh, we use Boolean operators and and or. We rarely use the not term. So we did use and and or for various intervention terms that were suggested to us by CHI team. And we combined it with study design and population search terms. And uh, this is something important to know that if someone is carrying out these kind of searches, it is important that you either go incognito mode or private uh, window mode. But, and uh, uh, this would probably help you in uh, getting uh, kind of fair uh, re uh, fair results like not based on what you are actually searching your uh, like your your earlier search history would probably not impact the kind of results that you're getting and then the search date search engine page numbers they were noted very meticulously like on which date was the search was conducted uh, and uh, the how many pages of the uh, 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 studies were there, but that were found all those things and then uh, because it was the update, we were kind of sure that we would probably find some studies that were already done in various earlier updates of the map. So we did check for duplicates and then we came up with uh, various codes for our convenience so that we could just not update the studies that are already there in the map and just upload only the studies uh, that are new that we found to these intervention specific search terms. And this thing, this particular intervention specific search terms strategy was quite useful because we found a good, very good number of studies uh, during this update, close to I think 170 for the effectiveness uh, EGM. So these are some of the intervention specific search terms that I was talking and how we use various uh, 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 Boolean operators and and or to uh, you know, come up with these terms and we searched them and found studies. So this is just a snapshot of how we reported, uh, uh, how we kept a record of all the website searches that we were conducting, what date it was uh, conducted, what was the URL number and all those things. And then we did the hand searches of some of the journals uh, from the past five years. Uh, and these are just representative of some of the journals. These are not all the journals, but just uh, to show some of the few, few journals that we did hand searches of. And then the citations of selected records were also screened to identify eligible studies. So uh, coming to this Cochrane crowd, so a Cochrane uh, crowd offers you this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, facility that you can uh, involve the uh, general public or general citizens into uh, screening certain uh, records for you. So this is quite useful when you are, you might have some constraints of resources in terms of manpower or you are running, you know, uh, you're short of time. Uh, and all those things because they're really quick and it's uh, carried out by a number of people across the globe. So this is uh, this was so we took help of Cochrane Crowd for getting a title and abstract screened uh, for the effectiveness and implementation map. So this is just a screenshot of uh, one of the uh, screening challenges that they have. So this is not actually our uh, uh, CHI kind of uh, assignment, but some another project that they had. So we generally show how many countries people, uh, how many country from how many countries people contributed, and how many classifications were made, and all those things. So this is just a screenshot of a tweet I did during uh, we had our implementation map uh, update on going through Cochrane Cloud, and we were hoping that people would join us for screening and title and abstracts. So as you can see, by that time, seventeen hundred and sixty six classifications were already done. So this is quite a useful uh, thing, as I mentioned, when you're particularly uh, con resource constrained. So, uh, but for uh, going through, uh, taking this path of going through Cochrane Crowd, you have to come up with a training module because the general citizens, they need to be trained around those issues of PCOs, like what is the population, what is the eligible intervention, uh, the comparison group outcomes and all those things. And then, uh, uh, these uh, training modules were revised in consultation with CHI team. And we, of course, have a practice test along with that, like uh, 10, 20 records uh, are given along with the 
decision first the what is the decision whether we are going to include this particular record or not and then along with that a description is also given why this decision is there like whether why we decided to include or exclude this thing so this these training modules and practice tests together they uh, kind of prepare the common citizens to screen those uh, uh, those reports so to qualify or to be eligible to screen those records the person has to uh, get a score of minimum of 75% uh, in the practice test. And then, uh, as I meant, as this was uh, mentioned in the CHI tweet uh, for the 2021 update of MAP, that around 3,141 records were identified uh, and they were screened by 42 researchers from 15 uh, different countries. And then there is a certain number of records that if you do a particular number of records, like if you screen a particular number of records, you get a, uh, an acknowledgement in the reports for your contribution. So 24 people earned a named acknowledgement for this thing. And as you can imagine, 3000 records were done in merely seven days. And for the implementation of it, we had even quicker turnaround and within four days it was completed. And as you might be wondering why uh, we have these 1278 individual classifications, because the number of records is 3141. So this is because every record gets screened by four people. Uh, and then uh, the algorithms are, you know, they play their role and they see whether the, I mean, based on the algorithms, the final decision is made whether the uh, record will be included or excluded. Uh, now moving to a brief overview of findings. So uh, as, I mean, uh, as Nick was mentioning, you can access these maps from the homeless, uh, from the CHI website. And we have close to 1,000 studies, 969 to be very precise. And uh, I think this is probably the biggest repository of open access uh, studies, uh, not really studies, but they're actually, this map, these maps are actually guiding you to those studies that this is, the, this is the amount of evidence that is there on homelessness in high income countries. So we had 562 studies in the effectiveness map and 407 studies so far in the homelessness implementation map. And out of these 70 are systematic reviews and remaining are the impact and process evaluations. And if we uh, see specifically uh, about the impact evaluations, close to 50% are the randomized control trials, which is somewhat unusual when I see it in light of certain other fields of studies where we might not have many randomized control trials. So this indicates that the randomized control trials are uh, a kind of an evaluation method that is feasible in the homelessness sector. And as Nick was also pointed out, that most references from North America and US and Canada specifically. In our reports, we've also done UK level analysis given uh, CHI is based in UK and that might be helpful for them to uh, sort of, you know, uh, to take this cause further by uh, sort of showing the findings, UK specific findings to the policy makers. So as regards to confidence in the findings of studies, most of the evidence is of low confidence. Uh, and that is because of different issues as I talk in this next slide. So if we talk of the impact evaluations, uh, low confidence studies are mostly on account of attrition and statistical power. And masking is also rarely done in these studies, masking or branding. And as regards to process evaluations, there are very few studies where they actually discuss the relationship between researchers and participants. And for systematic reviews, uh, the low confidence is mostly due to lack of reporting of a list of excluded studies and meta-analysis due to heterogeneity included studies. So basically, we do have different kinds of uh, checklists for, to assess the confidence in the findings of studies. So uh, based on those tools or the checklists, we actually evaluate how much confidence can be placed in the findings of these studies. And these... Uh, uh, specifically for the CHI uh, project, I think we had customized uh, the uh, tools or the checklist for both the impact evaluation and process evaluations and the systematic reviews, they were assessed using the AMP starting checklist. So this is a Prisma flow chart and uh, this is from the effectiveness map itself. And we had actually 557 studies. Then uh, CHI draw, drew up our attention to some of the studies uh, that they thought should be there in the map. And we came up with 562 studies into this update. So as you can see in this line, uh, 562 studies, they were, uh, they were found for the 2021 map of uh, 2021 edition of the effectiveness map. And the very first edition had 221 studies. So 
uh, a total of 341 studies have been found since the very first edition. So uh, for the uh, implementation map, I just uh, uh, entered uh, due to some mistake. I think this line has, uh, you can't see this line, but you would probably have to rely on the numbers that I'm giving you. So the third edition of the implementation EGM has 417, uh, 407 studies, and we had um, 246 studies in the first edition of the map. So we have come, uh, we have found 161 additional studies since the first edition of the map. So you can see that it's a, uh, the EGMs are a live synthesis tool. You can, you know, keep on adding the studies over the years. And thus, as you can see, we have now close to thousand studies in this uh, repository uh, over the years. So uh, this is again uh, about the effectiveness map and we had about uh, half the studies are randomized control trials, as I told you, and uh, this is particularly peculiar, I think. Uh, maybe uh, I might be wrong, but I think this is quite peculiar that we have good number of RCTs in this week. And this is the aggregate EGM uh, or the evidence and gap map for the effectiveness map. And you can see here, like uh, like the one, the version that I showed you in the very beginning, that is the full-fledged map where you can actually click on, they are the clickable icons. Like you can click on a bubble and see what are the studies and it would land you to a page uh, if the URL is working still. So that way, uh, but here, this is just an aggregate map, which can kind of give you a consolidated view of uh, what, uh, where the evidence lies and where it lacks. So you can see that services and outreach, uh, particularly with uh, when we talk in terms of uh, the health outcomes, we have good number of evidence uh, there. So is the case with the accommodation and accommodation-based services and health and social care. And this was probably the basis of the three systematic reviews that were commissioned to the Campbell UK and Ireland. Uh, and they have, I think, completed. One of them is already published in Campbell systematic reviews and the other two protocols are published as well. Probably the uh, findings will also be published in Campbell systematic reviews soon, but the draft versions of the reports can again be accessed from the SHA website. So you can see here the communications and financing are some of the sectors, rather the categories of intervention where we don't have much confidence, uh, where we don't have many studies. So this is not really about the confidence. I'm not talking about the confidence here. I'm just talking about the numbers, basically how many studies and under which areas. So if you talk about the implementation, uh, the homelessness implementation map, here again, you see that the services and outreach and accommodation and accommodation-based intervention, uh, uh, they have the good number of evidence where they're basically talking about the uh, program administrator or manager implement or implementing agency-related barriers or facilitators. But as the case can be, one study can have a multiple number of barriers and facilitators, which is not necessarily that a study that is talking only of the barriers of facilitator related to program manager or program administrator might not have any contextual factors mentioned. So there will be some overlap. But this uh, kind of give you, uh, gives you a consolidated view of uh, where you can, you know, uh, find much evidence and where you can, you know, where there is a possibility of conducting maybe systematic reviews or where you can conduct more trials or more impact evaluations to fill the gap. So like, so this is what uh, Nick was talking about. So you've got this EGM, it tells you where the evidence is concentrated, where the evidence is lacking, but what next? So what next is that you either commission systematic reviews, you write the reports, and then uh, you can also come up with something called a uh, toolkit, which in this particular case was called intervention tool. So as I mentioned earlier, so CHI commissioned these three systematic reviews and uh, another systematic review on case management intervention was taken up by SHO team. And uh, I was probably not aware, as you went, uh, as uh, Nick mentioned, that substance use, um, substance abuse, and uh, psychosocial interventions are also uh, being undertaken by some agency. I'm not pretty sure who are they. Uh, who, I mean, who is taking up? But these are also kind of reviews that are being uh, taken up uh, to add to this body of evidence. Uh, so Nick has already talked about this intervention tool, so I would not go into the details of this, but these are very useful tools for policymakers because they don't have time to read and go through the, uh, you know, n number of pages of a particular report. So this is a very concise tool that kind of, you know, gives them very handy information in very uh, less number of words. And it's quite uh, uh, useful because it tells you whether you can, whether you should uh, you know, invest more uh, time and energy into an, any set of interventions, whether they work or whether they not work and all those things. And if they don't work, why they don't work. 
so this is uh, uh, the link. I will probably put it in the chat of after the presentation. So these are the links from where you can access these maps, the effectiveness and the implementation map. These are some of the reports that are already published. We have actually uh, handed over the third uh, edition of the map and this will uh, uh, for the implementation map and this will soon be updated on the CHA website, I suppose. And these are some of the references. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Samina, uh, for a really interesting presentation. One of the things that I would really want to, to remark is that the collaboration with Campbell, with Campbell has been incredibly fruit, fruitful for us, uh, building on the evidence and gap maps and really starting to summarize sort of the relevant area and space in homelessness into these really precise tools has been the launch pad into other really useful resources as an intervention tool, the systematic reviews, the six systematic reviews that we have commissioned and published to date, as well as evidence notes and other resources. So I think one of the key points is to emphasize the use and, and the benefit of really starting to summarize all of these areas so we can focus a lot more efficiently into what are the gaps and which are the areas where there is substantial amount of evidence that we can synthesize. The other thing to remember in all of these cases is that, is that of course, as we continue to make progress, there will be innovations so that we can take into consideration because as Amina was mentioning, the use of the Cochrane crowd and the other algorithms that we have been using in the more recent versions of the AGM really allow us to do um, these really useful tools at pace and at a lower cost than it was needed in the past. So with that, I just wanted to uh, thank again, uh, Sabina and Nick for the really useful presentations and now open the floor for any questions that any of the attendees might have. Hi, Graham, this is Howard. Thanks both of you for the presentations. And yes, I agree, it's been a, a good and fruitful relationship and collaboration since the, since the start. Um, what can you say about the use of the map by practitioners? What sort of experience have you had? The reality is that to this point, practitioners have not been that engaged with uh, the maps. I think that the reality is that we feel that this is a much more useful tool uh, thinking about researchers and thinking about commissioners of research. But at the same time, it's really important that we start using the maps as the foundation to create other resources that are a lot more simple that can be targeted to practitioners. That is the case, for example, of the evidence notes at the intervention tool. I think that those type of resources that really go at the specific interventions are uh, a better target, um, a better use for practitioners. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree with that. I do. I think myself that also maps are not really suitable practitioners because they still take them back to the studies. And I think better practitioners, these products that don't take them back to the studies, but actually present the findings in some in some useful way, like like the intervention tool or the or the evidence briefs and other forms. Of summary. So I, I, I'd be inclined to agree with that. And I, I think you see quite a few people. I, so. I have a, another question then, because when people commission maps, they often, even though we explain, they misunderstand and think the maps are going to tell them what the evidence says rather than show what evidence is there. So do you run into that problem? I don't think that that's a problem. I think it's, it's a matter of making it really clear what the maps are for. So when we go back in time, five years ago, all of the evidence in homelessness was, was completely scattered all over the place. What the maps really allowed us to do was to bring all of that evidence to a single place so then we can start thinking about how to synthesize that evidence to actually tackle that question of what actually works and the things that we know uh, don't work. And in addition to that, identify where the gaps are so we can start commissioning research uh, mm -hmm. more effectively. So the gap is not, the evidence and gap maps are not actually answering the question of what works. They're helping us to bring all of evidence together mm -hmm. so that then those questions can be answered. Yeah, absolutely. So, so another question was the first edition of the map, there were, it was very few systematic reviews and the, the few that were there were mostly in health. So it was actually an example I usually use an under-reviewed area with a small percentage of included studies being reviewed. So 20, and now we see there are many more systematic reviews and across a broader range of topics. What do you think has been the factors driving that? I think that's a really interesting question, Howard. The reality is that in the space of homelessness, a lot of the research that was conducted in the past 
came from the health uh, space. So it was not surprising really that many of the studies that we came across at the beginning of about five years ago were really thinking exclusively around those issues. As we move forward, um, I think the sector has started to identify the gaps in the other, in the other areas and the, the evidence and gap maps have definitely played a, a part in helping us to, to do that. A really specific example, thinking about CHI as a commissioner of a specific system of use, since the uh, launch of the AGMs, we have commissioned six system of use in different areas, none of which were uh, precisely around health. The only one that is closer to that space is the one around psychosocial interventions, that is around all other uh, mechanisms to try to support people to make better uh, decisions. Can I ask a question if nobody else is asking? Um, yeah, nice to meet you all and uh, congratulations on, well, this map is really like a, a front runner in you know, how to build the evidence architecture, develop a toolkit and really make it useful. So um, thanks for, for the webinar. I guess my question is, you know, this is a great example of really living evidence synthesis um, where you, you're now on the fifth update and you're starting to use, well, you've, you've been using clock on crowd and you've been using machine learning. Um, and it would be really great to see this come into the Canva library because I, I think we haven't made a mechanism for you to get the, um, the, the kind of updates in, in, a, in a flexible and easy way. But I'd love to mm -hmm. maybe follow up with you to see if we could do that um because we sh we should be able to get um you know updates uh quickly and easily for things like this um so if you're interested i would love to follow up absolutely <laughs> absolutely yes absolutely yes uh let's let's definitely coordinate uh on that front that sounds like a brilliant idea yeah yeah i was being i've heard from other um you know uh people interested in campbell and collaborators you know how how can we support living synthesis? So I mean, this just seems like such a great um, uh, example. But yeah, I'd love to. Just, just to give you just to give you an example on on that, um, last year we decided to write a series of evidence notes, as Nick was was referring to, and now this year we decided to update those, and we're basically going back to the effective to the new version of the effectiveness map and comparing which are the new studies uh, that can be included. So the beauty of having um, these resources that are being um, renewed every couple of years is that exactly we can take a look again at what the evidence is suggesting so that then we can start uh, influencing how synthesis is, is done. So I don't see the AGMs as a one-off exercise. I think it, it would definitely depend uh, on different sectors, how frequent they are, they are done, but uh, in our case, doing them uh, on a regular basis has proven uh, really fruitful and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, it's a great example. I was just talking with um, uh, people at the World Health Organization yesterday who want to follow the lead of the What Works centers and uh, essentially do um, a toolkit and, and briefing notes, you know, for practitioners about um, the effectiveness of study, of of uh, interventions that are included in the map. So um, we'll definitely refer to your work and let's chat after about, you know, how can we make this easier to get this on the Campbell Library? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Sounds Great. excellent. Any last questions? We have one hand raised. Go ahead, yeah. please. Uh, thank you so much for your interesting webinar. I'm quite new to evidence and map uh, gap, uh, gap map actually i have a question uh, the maps that i have seen so far was based on the quality so the bubbles color was based on the quality not necessarily uh, based on the size of the studies done on a specific topics and interventions so which one do you think would help uh, to the primary and systematic reviews and the toolkits better uh, i mean measuring the sizes or no, just the quality, um, evaluating the quality of the previous studies. Sabina, maybe that's a question for you. 
interesting question. Actually, uh, it depends on your purpose. So that feature that is given there is just uh, like you add a segment based on you know what you want to show, whether you want to show the confidence in the findings of studies. So for example, if you're talking in terms of, uh, uh, let's say you are interested more in knowing where we do have more, uh, con uh, um, more robust kind of studies, so there you you may use that confidence in findings feature like uh, uh, like rather than the showing the study design so this uh, this feature can be used for any third kind of thing as well like not necessarily study design or confidence in findings but it could be let's say um, i'm not able to think of any filter as such but uh, i mean as per your need you can show like uh, so in, in if you want to show let's say in in the intervention and the outcomes in an effectiveness map but in addition to that, if you want to show another segment, then you can add and show that. But where, I mean, it depends on the purpose. Where you want to show that, you know, we do have high confidence or uh, have robust studies in this area. So people can decide that, okay, we can probably, you know, take up a systematic review on this particular topic. And uh, at, at the same time, it indicates that where you don't have, you know, very high confidence studies, you can sort of uh, raise a kind of, not really an alarm, but you can raise this point that, you know, there is need of conducting more quality studies in this area. And as we say, the quality is not necessarily, uh, we're talking in terms of the, that the study hasn't been conducted with a good quality, but it is actually the reporting of the findings. Like whether they have reported well or not is the main point, not necessarily, you know, uh, that we are saying that uh, this one, whatever contribution we have is, you know, of no use. It's just a reporting of the findings that we're talking of. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to elaborate on two points here. One's on the question, the other is to pick up what Sabina said. So the, the term we're meant to use, though we all slip into saying quality, is confidence in study findings, because it, it, it is an assessment of that. And, and an I often use Holmes is an example of this because attrition rates are very high in this area. Attrition rates of 50% are not unusual, particularly in the comparison group, because these people experiencing homelessness, they, they move around or there's just different ways of tracking them. Tra uh, tracking them. And so uh, that's a, so studies might have high, I remember one study which had powered to get 50% attrition, to allow 50% attrition, end up with 80% attrition. attrition. I and mean, it's really high. So that, so that does necessarily give us low confidence study findings. It's not the fault of the study team. So calling it low, that allowed for 50% is already high. So calling it low quality seems a bit mean. So we really should say low confidence study findings. So sorry, guys, we understand you're doing a really good job, but the attrition rate is too high to have good confidence. But the main point I wanted to make was about the flexibility of the EpiMapper software we use to make the map. So, so anything you code can be either a, a row or column heading, or a filter. So the row and column headings are obviously what they say. So on one map we've done on road safety interventions, there's a version of the map we show which interventions and regions as the, as the column headings, because that's a global map, but over 80% of the studies come from North America, even though 90% of road traffic injuries and fatalities are in developing countries. And so um, showing that regional variation of the version of the map makes that point very clearly. Now, in the filters, which are different, different indicators you can apply, can be region, can be study design, can be confidence study findings, you can apply to see just those studies that meet that filter. So you can see just for studies from North America, just for studies from Switzerland, Stable, there wouldn't be any, uh, and so on. Anything that's a filter variable can be made the segmenting variable. And the segmenting variable is the one that, is, that defines the bubbles. And you can have up to four bubbles. So you can make it study findings, but you could make it regions of the world. You'd have to split, make no more than four regions. You could make it study design. Um, so you would have just study design, where it was primary process. If you had process evaluations and impact evaluations and reviews in the same map, which we're doing some of our maps, then we could segment just by study design with no reference to to um, constant study findings. So it, it's really up to you. And as Sabina said, it was exactly the right answer. Is it depends on the purpose of the present that presentation of the map, what point you're trying to make. And so the common study findings is a traditional one, and it because it does make the point there's not a lot of high confidence studies here, which is usually the case, uh, because the study, the, you know, the critical appraisal tools are quite strict, and, and the, the principle of weakest link in the chain in, in terms of assessing overall 
overall confidence means most studies are best medium confidence confidence so that's usually the point we want to make and so that's usually the way we segment it but you can say you uh, just say you can segment anything you want to depending on the purpose excellent i hope that all of you found that really really useful we have now come to an end to the end uh, of the session so Hopefully you'll continue asking questions to the team and we'll of course be more than happy to respond via email or any other mechanisms. So do keep in touch and thank you again uh, to Sabina and Nick for a really useful presentation and hope that everyone has a great day. Thank you. Bye.